Good evening. Is this on? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, good evening. Today is Tuesday, May 22nd. Uh, regular meeting of the Fairfield Board of Education. Members present. Uh, Mr. Liu, Mrs. Gerber, Ms. Iacono, Mr. Dwyer, Mr. Fatabine, Mr. Carey, and Mrs. Brand, uh, as, as well as Mrs. Kennelly. Will you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Our first item on the agenda is student recognition. Let me join you. Yes, I'm, we'll do it from over here um, so that the principal and the students can join us. Uh, we had some um, superintendents and cave awards at the last meeting, but because of a field trip and other conflicts, some students could make it, so we're catching them up uh, tonight. So if um, Mr. Hatzis could join me and then we'll start with our students from Fairfield Woods Middle School and then we'll do the one student from Fairfield Ludlow High School. So our first recipient of the Superintendent's Award from Fairfield Woods Middle School is Jennifer Maldonado. Jennifer, come on up. Jennifer is a gifted athlete, has participated in Fairfield Woods Middle School track and cross country program as well as playing on a premier soccer league. For several years she attended the McGiving Leadership Camp where she has had the opportunity to learn about history, how she can make a positive impact in the future. Always giving back and helping others, she has set goals for her future that include a strong education in the field of science, playing Division I soccer and helping others. Jen reports her mother has been the most positive role model in her life, and she strives to follow in her footsteps. Congratulations, Jennifer. <laughs> the Cable Award, the first Cable Award for grade eight goes to Carly Sussman. Carly is a superior student, earning high honors in every quarter in middle school, organized a collection of gently used clothes from her neighborhood in an endeavor she called Carly's Closet. Uh -huh. Neighbors left clothes bundled at the curb, and every Saturday she would pick them up, organize them, and donate them to a local church. She's been active in Relay for Life, organizing bake sales, and convincing her principal to dress up in clashing clothes to help raise money for the cause. Just not tonight. <laughs> She's collected toiletries for soldiers, volunteered at soup kitchens, walked for multiple sclerosis, and volunteered to help supervise younger children and activities at the Jewish Community Center. She's a member of the orchestra and somehow still finds time to participate in gymnastics and soccer. Congratulations, Carly. And our other recipient of the Cabe Award from Fairfield Woods Middle School is Matthew King. I apologize for my voice that is just about leaving me, which the board members will probably appreciate later in the meeting, but right now I'll do my best. Matthew has consistently earned high honors for almost every marking period during his time at Fairfield Woods. Is an excellent role model and was chosen to be a peer leader. He's a dedicated football player in the Pop Warner program, has been chosen on four occasions for the Best Player Award, as well as presented with the Academic Award, and last summer he was chosen to attend a camp for elite players at Gillette Stadium, home of the three-time world champion New England Patriots. <laughs> <coughs> He's not allowing <laughs> He's also active in a lacrosse program at Wakeman and has received the Coach's Award, is a quiet yet powerful leader who shows kindness toward others, has a positive attitude, and stands up for what is right. Congratulations, Matthew. <laughs> I 
ask uh, Donna Russo to come up to um, congratulate our Webster House Award winner, who is Sarah Nisi. Sarah, come on up. Again, Sarah was one of the recipients of the uh, Rotary Award uh, just yesterday. Uh, Sarah has been recognized by the College Board as a National Merit Scholar and AP Scholar and was chosen last year to receive the Mount Holyoke Book Award for her outstanding achievements in liberal arts. She's a member of the National Honor Society, Math Honor Society, Science Honor Society, and Spanish Honor Society. Is captain of both the girls lacrosse and basketball teams, has earned all state and all conference status, and has been recognized as an academic All-American. She volunteers at the Wakeman Boys and Girls Club and recently represented the club at the National Keystone Conference in Texas. Sarah, congratulations. We schedule this so we can go right into the in the introduction of the new principles. So. Right. Um, as you know, we, um, we have four principals, elementary principals retiring this year, and um, they're all significant losses to the school system. I didn't add up all their years of service, but it's a lot. Um, and we did um, then begin the search to try to replace those four individuals. Um, it's a very large search committee headed up by Margaret Mary Fitzgerald, Anna Kataya Leonard, um, and involved um, focus groups at each elementary school, parents on the screening committee, teachers. Um, it was very extensive. Uh, these folks um, that you're going to be introduced to tonight survived um, the Spanish Inquisition. Um, several rounds of interviews um, and, and other screening tools that we can't make public. Uh, we are really happy to have announced these four individuals um, as the new principals of these school schools. So I'm going to have them come up after I tell you a little bit about, about them. I'll have them come up and just say a few words. I told them 30 seconds to a minute max. Um, and um, just so that we can get a chance to meet them face to face. And then we would take a break and the board can individually meet the student award winners and our principal award winners. So our first, uh, my first principal that I'm proud to introduce to you is Jason Bluestein. Jason will be the principal at Burr Elementary School. He's currently the assistant principal at Weston Intermediate School, where he's been since 2009. Prior to that, he served as an assistant principal in Southbury, and he did work in Fairfield as the district instructional improvement teacher, a curriculum leader for language arts at Fairfield Woods Middle School, and a eighth grade English teacher at Fairfield Woods Middle School. He also has experience as a teacher in grades four and five. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Bluestein to our community. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, for me, this is almost like coming home. And in fact, in the interview process, I talked a little bit about how um, Fairfield was really the place where some people tapped me on the shoulder and said, you can do this work. And uh, for me to, to, to come back as a principal is so gratifying. And I'm so thankful for the, for the opportunity. Um, I look forward to many years of, of, of great work um, at the building level and also at the district level. And I look forward to meeting all of you and, and working strongly, uh, closely with you. Probably not the best time to tell David that I'm a big New York Giants fan, but... Um, I'm surrounded by him. Yeah. But I thought I would make that public right now. So I appreciate the, op <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you so much. I really thank you. The... Uh, Team affiliation is not part of the screening process. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Our second um, individual to you will become the principal at Dwight School on July 1st, as um, Brenda Ziano will be moving to Riverfield to replace Paul Tueso. The uh, 
Mr. Scott Bannon has been appointed as the interim assistant principal at New Fairfield Middle School. Previously, he had been assistant principal at Meeting House Hill School in New Fairfield since 2009. Prior to that, he also worked in Fairfield as the instructional improvement teacher at McKinley Elementary School and has taught grades three and five at McKinley Elementary School. Please join me in welcoming to our community, Scott Bannon. Thank you very much and good evening. I have to start off with just a series of thank yous. Um, first and foremost to the, um, the 22 individuals who were sitting around the table when we interviewed in round one. I wanted to thank them all for their time. Um, everybody who participated to give me this opportunity is an honor. I had mentioned that during the interview process to be able to return to Fairfield is an honor, something that I feel privileged to be able to do. Um, like Jason said, coming back, it feels like I've completed a cycle to start off as a first-year teacher in the District of Fairfield to be supported by many wonderful people and to be trained by wonderful staff up in New Fairfield, to be able to come back and give back to the Fairfield community what was given to me in the past is just an honor. You know, somebody who I was thrilled to see here when I walked in, and I have to thank her, is Maureen Bonifant. She was my mentor. Uh, my first year of teaching so again it's just really great to come back and see so many wonderful faces and again I just thank you all very much for this opportunity next individual I'd like to introduce will become the principal at Holland Hill Elementary School on July 1st as Frank Arnone moves to Osborne Hill, replacing Mr. Lippman, and that is Laura Cutella. Laura is currently the instructional improvement teacher at McKinley Elementary School and has served in that position since 2010. She previously taught grades two and five at Burr Elementary School and taught first grade in Darien. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to our new principal of Holland Hill, Laura Cretella. Uh, members of the board, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me here. I feel so fortunate to be in Fairfield right now and to continue on in Fairfield. I have worked with phenomenal leaders and educators in town and I have learned so much from each of my roles in town, and I just really am excited to begin my principalship um, at Holland Hill. And I just want to thank everyone for this opportunity. And our fourth principal to introduce to you this evening is Elizabeth McGurry who on July 1st will become principal at Stratfield Elementary School. Ms. McGurry is currently the principal at Nichols Elementary School in Stratford and has served in that position since 2006. Prior to that, she served as an assistant principal in Norwalk and Dayville. If you can find Dayville, you're better than I am. <laughs> she also has experience as a fourth grade teacher Please welcome to Fairfield, Elizabeth McGoey. Thank you, everyone. And I already recognize a few shining faces, J and K, that I met. Did I get it right? <laughs> but I'm missing the J. Over there, okay. Um, I want to thank everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to be in Fairfield. I can't say that I'm coming home because this is, I'm new to Fairfield, but I'm hoping to make this my new home. I live right in Black Rock, so I'm right around the corner. Um, I noticed a few uh, new faces um, because everyone else was at the interview, so thank you. Um, but I'm really pleased to be here. Um, hopefully I can take some of the leadership skills that I have um, in Stratford and moved into Fairfield, and I can't tell you how much I feel welcomed here in Fairfield from the first call um, to the smiling faces. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I'm, I'm very excited to have these four individuals taking on leadership roles in the district. On July 1st, Fairfield is a very attractive place to work. We had an outstanding field of candidates, and we believe that we have got the four best, and we have them in the right places. And I think we're going to have an incredibly strong leadership team in this district uh, moving forward. So at that, I'll stop. And perhaps at this point, be a good time to take a break. Yes, definitely. I just want to thank all of you and welcome you to Fairfield on behalf of the Fairfield Board of Education. And we will take a very short recess so that we can all have a chance to meet you. Thank you. <clears throat> Grades preschool through five. Get out. Thank you. So, Anna Kataya Leonard and Mike Rafferty. Mike is the language arts <coughs> guru for grades pre K to five in the system, curriculum leader. Um, I'm going to turn it over to them, and I think they have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to sit out on the side, and others may want to uh, maneuver themselves into a different position. A minute or two to warm up. You're going to start first. So, thank you, uh, Chairperson Iacono, uh, fellow board members, Dr. Title, my esteemed colleagues, and uh, parents and community members. Tonight, with pleasure. I give you the preschool of grade five language arts curriculum. Yet I am the face of many. So may I please ask some of my fellow educators who helped develop the units, calendars, alignment, et cetera, if they could stand to be acknowledged at this time. So tonight we're going to focus on the uh, curriculum and what's inside it. So we're going to do uh, a little close reading, so to speak, um, which is one of the skills we want our children to do. So the first question, why change? Well, the first change, first reason for the change is the uh, last adopted curriculum is from 1998, making it 14 years old. But more importantly, the reason for change is if you look closely at the uh, last curriculum, You'll notice it was very general and would merely just state an objective or a skill across an entire year. What we've attempted to do is be a lot more specific and built it upon a continuum. The other thing we also did was review our data and realize that by uh, having a tighter alignment and a more assurance of rigor uh, adherence to a continuum, that we would uh, see uh, greater results and uh, rise above the plateau that we are uh, in right now. So how was it developed? Well, first there was a process of research and review. Then there were creations of calendars, year-long cal year calendars and units. There were teacher trials. Then there was an alignment to the Common Core State Standards. Then the materials were posted to the web in late March. Um, and we had a parent focus group in April. Um, uh, just recently, I checked the website. We had over 500 visitors from as near as Connecticut and as far away as China and Paris and Germany in between. So it must either be really good or really interesting. Um, also linked to the website, we had a survey for teachers uh, and uh, parents and community members to provide feedback. So how is the curriculum different and what areas can expect it to cover? So we're going to really just focus on the first five with the understanding that speaking and listening are involved in every literacy activity that we engage in. So let's get to the questions. First question, do we teach handwriting? The answer is yes. Here's how it differs. In the past, in the old curriculum, it would say use correct letter formation in writing. Now the new curriculum lays out inside a unit at a specific time of year the order of how to teach handwriting because these are the most common letters to start with in the handwriting instruction. The teachers are provided with resources to teach everything from manuscript to cursive. 
But more importantly, what we do after we teach is follow up with students. This is a delightful child who's now in first grade. And if you look at it from a handwriting point of view, you can look at this child's writing and see, oh, maybe we should work on teaching M's or H's or F's, which of course our fabulous teachers will do. But while you're working with students like this, don't forget to pay attention to their message. So this little girl wrote a message to adults that probably her mom and my mom told me, which is a friend is someone you know everything about, but like them still the same. So you can see she says that Maddie sometimes yells at me and her mom highlights her hair, still BFFs. <laughs> Do we teach spelling? The answer is yes. In the old curriculum, the standard merely just said use letters or letters to represent each sound in a word. Now the present curriculum uh, demonstrates for teachers uh, where and what phonetic or spelling elements to highlight across a continuum. Uh, learning spelling rules and uh, phonics um, um, patterns inside words is built on a continuum. And uh, the new curriculum helps do that while also reinforcing its notion on how to apply it to writing and spelling and, of course, reading. Uh, an example of a teacher resource gives them keywords to work on. This example, uh, this lesson, for example, uh, focuses in on reteaching around the vowel sounds. And on the top bit are five uh, base words that students would know. And if you look in this box here, the, by knowing those spelling patterns allows them to use it in a generative way to spell a lot more words. <clears throat> Uh, we'll be able with the new curriculum to compare how our students' spelling grows against normative data. Uh, this is an example of uh, 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 a spelling assessment that allows us to understand two things. How is our child uh, developing against normal kids' development in spelling? And then if you look at the error analysis, what phonetic or spelling elements can we reteach to the child to uh, improve their spelling, like that silent B on the end of crumb? Uh, do we teach grammar? You probably already know the answer because you're using your, one of your good inferring literacy skills <laughs> and realizing the answer is yes. In the old curriculum, it basically said write in consistent tense. Now, once again, there's a continuum for introducing um, key grammatical elements taught thoroughly. And uh, many of the units, uh, they will be taught uh, across the year and then reinforced inside uh, looking at uh, writers who use these uh, uh, grammatical elements effectively and then student writing as an exemplar to show kids how their grammar should be applied in their writing, which is why you study it. And um, one of the resources we gave to the teachers is predicated on the recommendations from the National Council of Teachers of English who recommend that uh, spelling uh, be taught with a few key uh, concepts taught thoroughly and directly linked to reading and writing. Of course, our wonderful teachers will teach the lessons, but more importantly, reach the children who have difficulty. This is a fabulous reading answer, but it also has something inside it that can be retaught in terms of a grammatical element. Do we teach critical reading? Our favorite thing, it's what makes our kids joyful readers. So while we work on critical reading, we ask them to do close reading and think about hard questions. So the common core, which we've aligned our units to, talks about a concept called text complexity. And there's a demand to increase the rigor of what kids do in language arts. So one way to do it is to change the text. So Frog and Toad is a book that kids could read. But if you wanted to make their life more challenging, you could give them Harry Potter. But that's only one way. You could give them a hard book, but ask them to do a simple task, like tell you what's Harry's middle name. You can go look on that later. But more importantly, if you look on this wheel here and go around the continuum, there's a level of thinking. And on the top are the easier things to do as readers, like summarize and be fluent. And on the bottom are more difficult things to do, which is to critique and analyze. In the old curriculum, we used to just ask our students to begin to develop an awareness of author's purpose. Now we work on big ideas and themes and practice using going back to the text. So what it looks like for children is, well, I got ahead of myself, sorry. Um, the teacher's resource gives them the opportunity to teach lessons that teach our students how to be critical and interactive readers. So you can see if you go across this week, teaching students how to, how to use prior knowledge and create a purpose. 
then how to analyze and code information, then how to embrace questions and confusions, and then ultimately at the end, determine importance and synthesize information. And we do that with student work very early on, asking our youngest readers. Uh, long ago, we used to wait for kids to do high-level thinking. Now we start right away. This was a child in a kindergarten class in North Stratfield. And when he did the work, when we asked him the question was the most important part of the book, we thought it was scribble-scrabble. And when he gave it to us, he brought it over to us and said, you know, if you look at this, you can't figure out what's happening, can you? And of course, there was a little girl he was talking to, and she said, no. She said, that's because there's an animal hiding in this picture. Because the book I read was about animals that hide. And the most important thing to know about this book is sometimes you're going to be in a place where you can't see animals, because the book is called Camouflage. And the little girl who was, he, he was talking to said, that makes so much sense. <laughs> and it does because he went back into the text to find evidence to support his thinking, which is a rigorous task. Easy book, rigorous task. Do we teach rigorous writing? <laughs> In the old curriculum, and you'll prob this will sound familiar to many of us, we taught um, how to write a paragraph with a topic sentence and supporting details. But the major infusion of information in our world, you have to write much more creatively while still doing the same thing. So we're now working on teaching kids how to distinguish between a subtle and direct thesis. Teachers once again get resources in order to teach using uh, mentor authors who we study and how they accomplish this, while also giving them editing checklists to keep track of all the things that writers need to do before they publish. So here's an example of a child working on a subtle thesis. So you're up at bat and hear strike for the third time. A base hit could have won the game. As you walk back to the dugout, you hear, what are you doing? You should have swung. What were you waiting for? You think it's one of the players, maybe a coach. But it's not. It's a parent, your parent. Now some people would say this isn't a subtle thesis, <laughs> but it really is. <laughs> the thesis was parents should let their kids choose their own activities and not force them into a particular sport. So. Very powerful writing, which will keep the reader engaged, as opposed to, I'm going to tell you five reasons I shouldn't play baseball. So how will we know if the curriculum is being successful? What is success? Well, uh, initially on the district level, what we'll do is measure our students' ability to read benchmark texts. So if you look at the end, there's end of year expectations for where students should be able to read. Text is leveled across a gradient, given a letter or a number. So the first thing we'll look for is make sure that more kids are reading, reaching benchmark each year. The second measures we'll look at come in only once a year. You can see on this chart that's up there, we can actually check on students' progress month by month. The other two measures, the CMTs which we presently have, will be another indicator for success. And the third one on the bottom, which is coming, are the Common Core State Standards Assessments, uh, which are not out yet but we'll use those as yet another measure. But while we wait for all those to come, our kids can tell us whether they're being successful. This is a child from Sherman who gave us a little feedback on the reading program. And this is by Nora. She said, when I read, I come alive. That world becomes my world, and the real doesn't matter. When I read, my life becomes full, exciting, with mystery, fantasy, terror. When I read, problems disappear, troubles fade, and I become one with the book. She's telling us she got something out of the reading curriculum. And then more importantly, we have a student at Osborne Hill who decides who's learning the power of writing. And I just want to highlight this here. He believes he should write to the Board of Ed to voice his opinion. He's interested in having recess in middle school. But he's telling us that he believes that writing has power and that if he uses the right words and lassos them in the right way, that he, in fact, will get people to listen. I have one other thing. I So of course we don't want to wait till fifth grade to find out if our curriculum is working or going to work. So I have for you a, a kindergartner at um, Osborne Hill who's going to tell you what he thinks of the reading curriculum.
to read the book, you have to look at the picture. Here it comes. Wait for it. Thank you. How do we turn this off? <laughs> oh. I, uh, I also passed around a, um, just a little bit of clarification at your uh, desk as a handout related to um, uh, a little more explanation about the grammar and the, con the key concepts I was talking about earlier and how they're taught um, in relation to our writing units of study um, so that you can get a better understanding that there's a continuum that we're trying to uh, approach over time. And if you turn to the back of the handout in the very last page, you can see that for every year there's a yearly calendar as a teacher resource that teachers could follow as a way for them to understand uh, uh, what month and what part of the year will be uh, introduced and worked on. And we gave that out to you as a, in response to a question we received from a Board of Ed member. Are these available in the back of the room? They are. Thank you. I thought I'd go around the board table so that everybody has an opportunity to speak. On the first round, if you could just limit yourself to two questions, and then we'll go back. Mrs. Brand, do you have anything you'd like to ask? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. We've um, talked a lot about differentiation in the classroom. And what I didn't see and I, I thought would be helpful um, would be to see what we're going to do with, in general, some ch children with special needs and also children that we think need to be challenged with more difficult pieces. What I saw was what your expectation is for the grade, but what does that mean and how are you going to be able to accommodate um, children that might need something different? Well, the, the standards are the, um, the expectation we have for all children. What our teachers will generally do is modify the teaching to, meet, to allow kids to reach it and exceed it. Um, so from a curriculum point of view, it's generally you're going to get a presentation of what are the high standards we expect. If you remember the wheel that I talked about, that talked about from summarization all the way around to critiquing and analyzing, those are the things that you would want most uh, high-level readers to work on is the ability to critique and analyze their reading and, of course, infer and connect and those other higher-order thinking skills that we want kids to work on. So in, um, the curriculum can't uh, address that. The teachers can. Um, what the curriculum delivers is that the expectation that we work all around that wheel and that we have high expectations that we want the benchmarks. Uh, the other thing, the benchmarks that I mentioned about the end of year expectations for kids to read. So um, every teacher would be able to provide the differentiation. The curriculum um, has it built in. So for example, yeah, if, you, if you think about the continuum of phonics skills, for example, so let me take our control vowels, for example. That's something you would expect to work on in second grade. So if you had a child in, uh, who was in third grade, um, you, a teacher would, would go back to earlier parts of the continuum based on assessments that we have um, to be able to determine what part of the continuum do I need to go back and reteach. Conversely, you can do the opposite, which is once kids have mastered that, you can start, you can start allowing them to work on things above the grade level standards. Then I guess I, I think about that's the what. I'm thinking about the how. Are you going to do flexible grouping in, in the classroom to be able to, because I keep trying to picture one person addressing all these various special interests of the students, and I, logistically I'm just wondering how you're going to do that. Well, if you, um, you know, it's funny. A lot of people when they visit, they think that um, it would be hard to keep kids' attention for a long time in this day and age. But you'd be surprised you walk into kindergarten. And I've been in kindergarten teacher rooms in this district at this time of year. The kids will work on reading and writing projects for 30 to 40 minutes. And the teacher is able to access uh, small group instruction and sometimes individual instruction okay. in that time. And we've had a lot of professional development, Ms. Brand, uh, on small group instruction, particularly over the last few years. Uh, so if you go into many of our elementary classrooms, you'll see oftentimes teachers with small groups, three or four kids huddled around with them, um, and there's been a lot of PD on that. In fact, that was actually my, my next question was, we have a new math curriculum, we have now a new language arts curriculum. Do we have 
um, built in and when do we have it built in for professional development so that when we start that we're up to speed. And part of that was in reference to, I think, the document that had um, grades preschool um, language arts curriculum. And it's, to show you what I'm, which one I'm referring to, it's this one. But on the second page of it, towards the bottom, it talked about the equipment that, you know, text, books, and smart boards. And one of my concerns is with professional development, a lot of schools don't have the, have the same number of smart boards across the district. So are we, what are we doing in terms of addressing that in professional development and making sure that they actually have those pieces of equipment? Yeah, our um, curriculum is not solely dependent on a piece of equipment. That we're, we've written a curriculum that can be delivered in all of our classrooms that can be enhanced with technologies and clearly uh, working with the IT department and Ms. Parks, part of our long-term long plan would be to put more resources in classrooms. Um, but regarding professional development, um, PD doesn't just occur through technology, although that will be one venue. We also have language arts specialists that the, uh, particularly the board has supported in the last couple of years, that on the ground everyday PD is occurring through those language arts specialists, along with the utilization of the PD days and Tuesday afternoons uh, that we have access to teachers as well. If I, if I could just add on that the lessons do not depend on the use of technology to teach them. Uh, for example, when you're doing close reading of text, you could do it on a smart board or give everyone a piece of copy of text. We, we tried to, in that notion and that answer to that question, we tried to keep an eye to the future and realize changes, especially in technology, is happening so fast, it's hard to predict what will happen next year. But we wanted to leave ourselves open with the ability, um, if technology is readily available, that we would like to have professional development. Uh, be part of the plan too in the use of technology. Okay, thank you. Do you have something, Mr. Carey? Yeah. Uh, first, I just would like to thank our team and, and the, I think 60 or 70 teachers I read that were involved in developing this curriculum. Uh, I think it's an excellent uh, update to our program. Um, my only question at this point is can you give us an idea of how much time uh, in our students' day at this level is spent? daily, weekly on language arts? Well, it depends what you classify as language arts. So, of course, if you're in social studies, I see that as a language arts subject because you're reading in the genre of social studies. But our children are going to spend anywhere from two hours up working on it. Per Thank day. You. Per day. Mr. Fabi. If I were running the school, it would probably be much more. So that's why they won't <laughs> let me run a school. I guess real quickly. I. Um, I think you gave a very good presentation, by the way. I think it was, it was very good. Thank you, you and your team. It was, I actually paid attention and enjoyed <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> Thanks um, for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only question I have basically relates to in your, uh, one of the memos you handed out uh, dated May 18th, it was referred to before, and the budgetary impact. You indicated it's going to be a, a, a multi-year budgetary impact. Or, do you, would you foresee that to be something substantial and something that would be spread out evenly over multi-years or is there one year which would take more of a cost than other years? Well, the, the Common Core is predicated on the notion of uh, allowing kids to have a wider range of exposure to text. So the bulk of the expenses will be around books, which are expensive. Um, so instead of uh, trying to buy them all at one time, We've, uh, we do a thorough inventory of what we have presently and then build it accordingly so that we can keep up with uh, the demands of informational nonfiction text that we want to expose our kids to. So it don't look like I answered your question. Any one year would be more of a budgetary impact than others or are you going to spread out over the multiple? I've already thought about it across uh, a couple of years so I didn't um, foresee overburdening one year as opposed to the others. Thank you. Our challenge, Mr. Fatabine, is um, projected 230 classrooms in kindergarten through fifth and plus five more pre-K. You do anything 230 times, that adds up. So we didn't want that to be all uh, hitting the budget in one year. So we thought a multi-year approach would be um, the most fiscally efficient way to do that. Thank you. I'd just like to add my thanks to the staff who have come out at night in support of the work that they've completed over these several months uh, and thank also the uh, the summary memo as well as the detail. I think it's a very, very good presentation. 
I have a comment on professional development, but we have a discussion on that during the budget, so I think I'll hold that comment for that time. That's it. Mrs. Gerber? Um, yeah, I had a question um, kind of about basics, you know, grammar, punctuation, spelling. I know there's a lot of that embedded in all these different lessons here in the different curriculums, but are there ever times when you're going to focus, especially in the older, you know, three through five, say, in really kind of teaching the basics and really, I don't want to say drilling, but, you know, really getting it so that it becomes a second nature type thing so that if you're editing, you're editing for content and maybe little, you know, things here and there, but, you know, there's this spelling is a problem. Um, you know, I, I mean, my son's in eighth grade and watching the whole progress, there's still a lot of misspelled words <laughs> going on and, and punctuation and grammar. And I just think the more you can instill that earlier on, the better it is. And, and is it helpful to have, say, a grammar lesson, a punctuation lesson, you know, either at the beginning of the year or a review or that type of thing, just to really instill it so it becomes something that you don't even have to think about that much? Well, <clears throat> we do actually have lessons on that all the way through elementary school. And one of the things we try to do to get at it is to slow down the writing process. Um, this is where technology has not helped us. Um, kids live on the impression that I've written it, it's fine. Or the computer checked it, it knows better than I do. But you know as well as I do, those are two fallacies. And so um, we, we, uh, we try to work diligently to slow down the writing process so kids can spend the amount of time it takes to really revise, then edit. They're two distinct steps. Sometimes kids rush them into one step and something gives and it's usually spelling and punctuation and grammar. So we do have specific lessons on it. Um, this is probably where Mrs. Brand's comment uh, sometimes comes back to haunt us. If you're a fourth grade teacher and you have great writers like we do in Fairfield, they produce some pretty long written pieces and you have to edit and revise all of them, it becomes a challenge for them. So sometimes they focus on things that may be slipping through, and that may be what you see as a parent. Um, but one of, our, uh, one of the things we've talked about as a department is slowing down the process more. So not having kids write more, but write better. And the only way to do that is to slow down the writing process. So Americans are obsessed with product. We have to slow down the product and emphasize the process. So. And the example in front of you, Ms. Gerber, uh, that was handed out this evening uh, is a scope and sequence of those uh, lessons intentionally given direct instruction to students. You'll note the grade one writing curriculum calendar um, refers to, in the second part, capitalizing proper nouns, uh, using the word, wor word wall for spelling, using transition words, completing sentences, single and double subjects. So there, there's, is, there is direct instruction on those types of lessons that you're referring to. And then the other question I had is about reading. Um, just in terms of the types of books that we encourage students to read, I mean, I think early on in kindergarten and first, you're looking for those just right books, and you don't want kids to overwhelm themselves and take things that are too challenging. But I find that sometimes moving forward into third, fourth, and fifth grade again, there tends to be sometimes a falling back on the more comfortable texts and the easier books and not stretching as much. And is there something? that we can do to try to encourage students to really challenge themselves a little bit more and maybe have an easier book and a harder book. It just seems that there seems to be more of kind of a stepping back away from challenge, challenges um, even in the older elementary grades. Um, the answer is yes. Um, I, I hesitated for a second because as a, as a human being, as an adult, I never go to the library and say to myself, I'm a really advanced reader and I need hard books. I always look for books that are just right or comfortable to read. So one of the things that the Common Core is going to uh, really help us get better at is the ability to um, put rigorous text in front of kids. Our teachers are, are very good and have spent a lot of time talking and learning about how to, how to work with kids to go to the next level and not stay in a safety zone where there is what we'll call no reading work for them. So um, that is a, an area that um, I want to work on a professional development in the coming years in relation to um, embracing what the Common Core is asking us to do and answering your question at the same time. So it is definitely on our front burner to, to allow kids to find that just right way to push themselves and not stay in a safe zone. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, again, thank you all for your hard work and um, dedication towards trying to get our curriculum the best it can be. My questions um, are going to be more just about the development of curriculum, um, though I might have some other questions about the curriculum specifically itself. So you would, it's a 14-year-old before this that we hadn't unfortunately looked at it before that. And then how long did you take between the time that you recognized until now? Is it how long have you been working on it? Well, um, because literacy is multifaceted, you're talking about writing, reading. Some of the writing research and initial work was done before I arrived in the district. Um, I was here when um, they were working on the reading, and then we worked on the uh, grammar, uh, spelling, and word work in the last three years, I would say, two, two and a half, three years, uh, more align, aligning them and identifying resources that could help us meet the goals of them. So three, four years, you've been trying to research it, researching right. and pulling this together. Okay, right. best great. Best practice together, yeah. Great. Um, and I know from the last um, curriculum, the math one, we talked a little bit about pilot programs. And I believe what, um, what number five, the various units were implemented in all schools, mm -hmm. teacher feedback was collected. Is that, so to speak, the a pilot or was there not a pilot program done? Um, uh, pilot per se, not by the definition. What we uh, utilized was a process of developing, putting in classrooms, gathering feedback from teachers and going right back to the revision table. Mm -hmm. So it was a cyclical process where we were writing, testing ideas and lessons out and revising as we were going along and throwing things out that didn't work and then re just uh, keeping things that were just uh, gems in the classroom. So it was more of a, a cyclical process of development as opposed to a pilot mis per se. So then there, there, there isn't any, I guess, byproduct of that to finally say, all right, we're going in the right direction or, or not? Is it in smaller increments or is there finally, let's say, after we've done so much time working on this and collecting all this data from the different teachers and their comments and their feedback, is it all compiled together and looked at? Yeah, it was a refinement process, and I think the compilation is before you, okay. along with um, very thick implementation guides for teachers. Right. Thanks. And, um, and then just, again, going down those numbers here, um, it's great that the documents were uploaded to the web and that you'd had all these um, people sign on and look at that. I think that's very encouraging. The parent focus group, that encompasses how many people? Uh, 25, about 25. Okay, and that's a, what, a, a, like, like the last curriculum, a, a three hour? Like all curriculum. A th yep, it was yeah. a one-time meeting. One-time meeting, okay. And the curriculum coordinating council, is that, what's yes. that, same thing? Yes. Okay, all right, great, thank you very much. Oh, you know what, actually I had one more question. So are, are you trying to, if this gets approved, you try to implement it for the next school calendar year? It, it is a curriculum that we will be implementing based on your approval, yes. Okay, and, and, and so you get to work on it right away, you're working on it over the summer. Hypothetical, not that I'm going in this direction at all. What if it's not approved? Does it, I mean, if, if, we, if we postpone for hypothetically two months, um, and I guess Dr. Tyler can chime in here too. What does it do? do? Would we not be able to get it ready for uh, the next calendar school year or would it just be tighter or is it something that says absolutely can't do it now? Well, we, um, we, build, we build our professional development timeline and plans on this. We've, um, you know, we have orders ready to go July 1. We pull the trigger when Ms. Munsell says we can order, we order. Um, elementary folks, we like to get together and lay out plans months ahead of time. So we have a whole, calendar. we have a whole calendar. We have a slate it's, waiting. Right. So, so it's already in motion, so to speak. And if it, if we were to say stop, it would really throw a huge monkey wrench into it. It, yes, that would be a good way to describe <laughs> that. Yep. Monkey, big monkey I mean, wrench. If, if, you know, this just occurred to me, a little latitude, if I may, and it's just something for the board for us to ponder on. And I think talking about curriculums a little bit in general is that something occurred to me the other day as we were pondering the math one, because I know that that same fear was, was um, 
communicated in that, gosh, if we stop, we slow down, we're in trouble. And it's one of the things that we get to do as a board is, is approve the budget, I think, and, and, and approve curriculum. And yet, if hypothetically we were to say, yikes, nine people or eight people or the majority to say, yikes, there's a problem here, um, we don't want to throw a monkey wrench into it. Again, this is all just hypothetical. So I'm starting to wonder if we might, as a board, reevaluate how we look at curriculum so that it gets to us earlier. Because if it just gets to us now and we were to say stop, we're doing a disservice to our district. But if we don't go and follow our gut, if we don't like something, not to say that this is unlikable, then we end up looking in the eyes of some people like we're rubber stamping. And I don't want that to happen. So my thought is, out loud, is that maybe somehow or another we put into motion where we are possibly included a year earlier just to get us an idea of where we're going and that we can, I know, I'm just a little attitude on that, we can Thank then. Thank you. I, I want to move on. I do want to address that just one bit by telling you that we used to have a curriculum policy, which we did do all of that that you're just saying, and we voted as a board to get rid of it. And one of the solutions to that was that a board member could join any one of these curriculum groups at any particular time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's already been asked, answered, and addressed by this board. Um, just, I, I don't personally, maybe I did vote for it, but I don't remember that. But you, you did. Um, okay. <laughs> All right, I want to no, move on you to know Mr. So well, uh, but Mr. Me just, Mr. Let me Mr. Just, Lou, please. Yeah, I'd no, like I just want to say at the end of that, I just think we could reevaluate that again because I think it's a fair point. That's fair. Thank you. Thank Mr. Comerty. Again, my thank yous for the members of the committee and, and, and all the work that went into this. And um, I am loving the format of this May 18th mem memo, which it's the second one we've had in that format, and it makes at least my life a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> first question, preschool language arts curriculum. Um, I know we have the early learning center and so forth. Do we make that curriculum available to the other preschools in town it's just so that we are I mean, those kids are going to be coming into our system. They know what we're looking for and, 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 and what the expectation of those kids are entering kindergarten. All of our curriculum is public, but I will have to say that this is the first time we're bringing before the board at any time a preschool curriculum for approval. So upon your approval, we will be happy to share it with them. Okay. I, I just think that would be a great foundation for them to, to see, you know, again, our curriculum and, and, and what we're looking for in the language arts with those yes. kids entering the system. So I thank you for that that part of it. Um, I'm a big assessment guy. I'm not a big testing guy, but a big assessment guy. Um, in the last page of your May 18th memo, um, when you talk about <clears throat> the assessments, and on, I think it was your second, um, the last slide before the fifth grader, um, and by the way, wait till he gets to see silent sustained reading in middle school, he'll really have a problem with recess. <laughs> <coughs> um, I was happy to see that you, you, you have a rubric um, set up, before, you know, as a, at least it was listed as a priority over CMT testing and, and the core curriculum standards. Um, when we get CMT results, that's all we ever get. And, and, and this is just a point of reference. When, when we get those, what I'd also like to see is how you think we measured against your rubric as far as attaining the goals within the district that you set within the curriculum, because the CMT is not necessarily a test of how we're achieving our curriculum. Um, so th those are just my two points, and thank you again. Thank you. <coughs> Mrs. Canelli. I had five pages of questions, yeah, and I was really hoping the other board members were going to ask some of them, so to bail me out here. Um, <laughs> the, the Maybe if there are some ones that, that are really pressing for you, and if right, there are other that's ones what I'm that can be answered offline, and then we can publish the yeah. results online for everyone to read, that would be great. <sighs> wow. Um, the first question of mine that even got asked was uh, Mr. Convertitas regarding the preschool. Um, clarify for me, though. We actually have four preschools, don't we? we have, there's the, the program we offer at the ECC. There's the program, the separate preschool up at Ward. Uh, Ludlow has a preschool in-house, and Burr. So those are all? Well, the uh, preschools at, at Ludlow and Ward are part of the Consumer Sciences uh, Curriculum Department. Right. Right. Those are not under the preview of 
the elementary curriculum instruction department. Uh, the curriculum we've written uh, primarily is for the uh, classrooms at the ECC and up at Burr. Okay, where to start? Um, I guess actually I do want to build a little bit on Mr. Liu's point, um, which is that I also don't enjoy the feeling of being under the gun that we must approve a curriculum. Um, and I, maybe it is going to be a topic for conversation. I did actually go to the parent focus group because I wanted to get the background on this curriculum. And, and it was a very well run meeting. It was an awful lot of give and take, a lot of great ideas shared around that table. Um, but I don't for a second think that one meeting held is necessarily going to be enough. It's not convenient. It happened to be a time I could make it, but I actually agree with Mr. Liu's point very much. And there are several things in here that I, I'm not completely comfortable with. Um, building on Mrs. Gerber's point about the grammar, it's an awful lot of introducing, and at no point am I convinced that it's clearly stipulated that there is a mastery that's expected. A mastery was a, a comment um, that we kept coming back to with the math curriculum, and yet I don't see it in this curriculum at all. There's, there's a sense of things are being introduced, there's a sense that things are being taught, but taught for mastery with an expectation that children are held accountable, I'm not finding. Um, I had sent to you an example of another curriculum which had that embedded in it and which, okay. Um, but that's still, I mean, case in point of mastery, the example of the, the fifth grader that you posted up there, which was, I enjoyed reading, and yet instantly found several run-ons, um, spelling mistakes, numbers not written out, and... Are you talking about the essay? Yes. That's a planning sheet, not an essay. Okay. And, um, but I guess it reiterates I that that's supposed to be something that a student has mastered. And so that, that's just, and I say this as, I mean, I'm, as a high school English teacher, that it's really pretty horrifying, to be blunt. Some of the thing now that's not in Fairfield School District, um, but I know it's lacking in the education that, that students in general are receiving now, and it, it represents a, a pedagogical switch from the prescriptive drilling to descriptive grammar, and now they're coming back to somewhere in between. And again, I don't see the expectation of mastery in here, and perhaps you could comment on that. The, um, to go to the notion of mastery, you know, one of the things I did consult uh, Westports, who does say uh, right underneath uh, that they do ask for mastery, but understand that mastery will be dependent on children's exposure. So they, while they do write it, they understand, just as we do, that mastery is taught depending on where the child is on the continuum. So I don't, I don't want for a second for you to think that although the curriculum document is written in a way that we have no interest in students mastering these skills or strategies. Oh, I, I don't think that at all, but it's, I don't see it written. I, I'm wondering where's the expectation so that somebody coming in, if they say, I want to make sure my student is, is up to par with everything that they're supposed to know, or if I'm a parent at home. I've, I've often asked at parent-teacher conferences, when do I start correcting spelling? When do I start being supportive of the teachers in that regard at home? Um, whether it's the letters home from my third grader or, you know, in earlier grades. I mean, I think parents like to know, when can I start holding my child accountable for that? We hold children accountable spelling in first grade. There are lessons on how to revise and edit, and in the editing lessons it's addressed on an editing checklist and resources you use when you cannot spell. So that right from the earliest grades, the expectation is that they'll uh, master that. Unfortunately, uh, in elementary school, as kids are exploring language and learning new concepts, it's one thing to demand mastery and quite another to expect it in, um, in a, what I'll say a short time frame. Um, we expect our kids to have lots of discussion, lots of exposure to reading and writing, which will develop their ability to master it. If we, if we, if we don't push them to stretch themselves as writers, they won't take chances. And then therefore, they could master the skill writing like, let's say, Steinbeck, when we might want them to try to write like Faulkner once in a while. So when you write like that, you take chances and you break grammatical rules. So mastery for me is dependent on what the child is trying as a writer may make mastery come into question. Okay, so it, it is sort of a diametrically opposed view from what we were being asked to buy into with the math, 
which is mastery is expected and there's move, we're moving on from there to more difficult concepts and they're expected to have that foundation down and that is not what the teacher is supposed to be spending classroom time on anymore. So it's, and I'm not saying I disagree with it, I'm trying to clarify it. We don't, we don't ever say we're done with something or uh, we're moving on. That a lot of it has to be, children in literacy don't all move along the same pathway. It's a little different than math. And with that expectation, when children aren't meeting mastery, uh, our teachers work in um, many, t more so in writing than in reading, individually at students, students to get them to reach mastery on those subjects or skills that were taught. Um, the, the things that we've listed over time, we would expect that our kids would have mastery by the time they finish elementary school as they work with them in more sophisticated ways and fashions. Mrs. Canelli, I'm just yeah. going to go around the table again. Does anybody else have any follow-up? Um, and I haven't, I just want to first say that I think you did a really good job with your presentation and I thank you for all of the effort that you put forth. Thank you. And you hit upon a lot of things um, having had children move through the system I, to slow down the writing, that, that's really, I can see why and how you're going to do that, so thank you. Um, and just to the board, if the board wants to bring back the curriculum policy, um, the curriculum um, subcommittee, that's certainly the purview of the board. That's something that should come up during um, board goals um, when we do that. Does anybody else have any um, follow-up on the uh, curriculum? Yes, Mrs. Brand. Yeah, there were a couple of things. When I'm looking at um, under assessments, for instance, um, and I think it's, it's, it's tagging on to what Mrs. Kennelly was speaking to, and it's on uh, kindergarten and grade three. And, I, and perhaps it's because this is teacher language, educator language, and not something that's familiar to me. But I see things that are being taught, not assessment tools. So I'm, I'm wondering when we're talking about alignment, how we're going to have alignment if folks aren't assessing with the same standards. And, and that was a concern for me. Um, and it certainly would be a concern as the children are starting to leave elementary and transitioning into um, the middle school. But I look on page three, for instance, and I see assessments and I see universal assessments. DRA2, letter, um, letter sound identification. Those are objectives, but I didn't see them as an assessment tool. They so are assessments. The reason they're assessments is they're highly predictive for first grade reading success, and therefore knowing what kids know about letters and letter sounds gives us an insight to where kids are in the continuum. I, I understand that. I guess what I'm saying is what's the timing and what kind of assessment tool are you using that is constant throughout the district so that everyone appreciates what that means? It's called the DRA2. That is the assessment tool. Okay. All right. That's it is what given, I didn't understand. It's given uh, kindergarten through third grade now. Oh, you're talking about the degrees of reading power? That no, was? that's a different test. Okay. Then I'm, I'm the DRA. And the letter, a letter sound identification is an assessment. We give okay. that to all kindergartners initially and then those who have not mastered it throughout the year. Concepts about print again is an assessment, mm -hmm. and the and we have specific writing samples, uh, prompts that we give, that we collect a couple times a year. Yeah, I remember that. So those are and all of those are collected and compared not just with schools but from school to school too. Correct. Yes. Okay. That was the other part because I kept looking at this and I was trying to understand and make sure that we had something that was common. We have um, a robust um, assessment calendar like we did in mathematics. We have one in literacy as well. And then since we don't have fifth grade in this piece, part of it is, again, what this piece of curriculum and what impact it is going to have on the fifth grade and the future classes. Are, is this going to lead into? We do have fifth grade. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, not fifth you, grade. You um, I'm six. thinking sixth grade. Six. Thank you. Again, the transition in what is going to happen to the middle school curriculum to accommodate the changes here? Yeah, my, uh, my secondary counterpart and I have worked uh, closely around this. I've, mm -hmm. He's uh, been uh, on board and knowledgeable about all the things that we're doing and is trying to keep the alignment straight through middle school. But since your, your benchmarks are different, then I guess I'm wondering what are they doing? To, are they changing and modifying what they're doing in the middle schools to be able to accommodate what we're doing now? Um, 
They are. They have worked on assessments that are more in line with ours. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. And the Common Core may change all of that. That's exactly. So we won't even have this discussion in a couple of years, probably. Yeah, that's that's actually what my expectation was. I'm I'm just don't want to have a lapse in between, is where I was going with. I that. think you'll find most of our teachers will tell us that we have plenty of assessments. Okay. Um, and, I, and I think the other questions um, a lot of folks have already touched on. I still have some more, but I'll be happy to write some of those in. Thank you very much. And I'll make sure that if we could just get the answers published up online so everybody knows what we're discussing. Does anybody else have anything from this side of the room? Anybody else on this side? Mr. Convertito, Mrs. Kennedy, <coughs> Mr. Liu. Sure, Mr. Liu. Um, thank you. Just to respond to what you were saying about the subcommittees, uh, it's that's why I don't remember it because I wasn't on that subcommittee, which um, again I think is is reason why we shouldn't have subcommittees because someone like Miss Canelli, who is a teacher, brings Mr. Lou, brings I just wanted to talk to the curriculum. Aspects we can that talk I can't bring. The, no, no, I just wanted to say that Mr. since you Lee, brought it up, please, you're out of the order. Other, the other questions I'd like to ask, I'm going to let. Um, I'm going to give my two questions to Mrs. Canelli. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, yes, I can. Um, maybe I'm, I'm missing something here um, based on the questions from the other board, but w when I read through this, and, and if we could just take, let's take the first grade curriculum, um, and I open it up to the, the first page, and, and I read the overview, uh, the year at a glance was basically the three marking periods and, and what you're doing in each marking period. Um, then I have essentially, I guess, what the teacher's resources are and the reading resources and the and the, and the writing resources, okay? That last column on page three, it is m my assumption was, and correct me if I'm wrong, that those are what this overview in, in, in central understandings on the left, central questions in the, in the center, and on the right-hand side is what we're using to assess if they've gotten what we expect them to be under the essential questions. Am I reading the curriculum document correctly? So if, if I'm page three, grade one overview, reading, writing, and work study, central understanding, students comprehend and respond in literal, critical, and evaluate ways uh, to various texts that are read, viewed, and, and heard, okay? And then I go to the, the, the essential questions, which is basically how they're, how they're learning it and so forth. And the last column is an assessment tool the, to make sure we're achieving those. The assessments there. go back to the central understandings, and that's a way for us to understand whether kids can comprehend and respond in, in literal and, and uh, inferential. So there's a full assessment and rubric in each curriculum and each, each phase in this, this year at a glance, marking one through three marking periods. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I was reading it. Thank you. Mrs. Canelli. I really won't go through the five pages. I will email them. <laughs> but just, I have one, a couple of questions out of curiosity. First, um, that parent focus group did meet in April. And I was wondering from April to now, what tangibly changed in the curriculum based on the parent feedback, the focus group feedback, the teacher, all, all the surveys online? Um, I mean, 500 visitors and people filling out that survey. What changed? Well, I, I didn't want to tell you, but only three people filled out the survey. <laughs> and um, you were one of them, weren't you? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, t I told Anna I can hear your voice in the answers. So, so two, something wrong. two people completed the survey. <laughs> So you had a survey and five questions, pages of questions. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and, and they could have been from Saudi Arabia or France, for all I know, because I can't track them. Um, you know, one of the things I was hoping to get from the parent focus group was the idea of what they're looking for in terms of consistency. So I really saw it as going forward. That was why one of the questions I, I was interested in hearing from parents is the types of texts they would like their kids to be exposed to. And that's going to be work that we're going to go forward as, as we implement the, um, a curriculum. The other thing is a conversation for uh, uh, my staff and my teachers is around consistency in spelling and grammar, which are clearly another area that I heard loud and clear from the parent group. So I really felt that's my charge, and that's the feedback um, 
So I didn't change the document so much because it's largely built around standards. And while people have opinions about standards, it's hard to say, we'll no longer summarize. We're not for that anymore. So a lot of the document stays intact because it's built around standards. But the implementation for me from the parent focus group is what they want to see in terms of what this curriculum will look like for their children. But what it also did for us was um, uh, affirm that we were headed in the right direction with the uh, scope and sequence and the structure for spelling and grammar because over and over we heard from the parent focus group, similar to what Ms. Gerber was saying, is, you know, tell us when are you teaching grammar? What are the spelling lists? How, when can I expect certain mastery of some basic skills? And we felt really comfortable we could go to the document and show the parents the structure and the expectations from year to year and how we've built it across, not only within the year, but across years. And I think the biggest uh, imp impact that the focus group had for us was um, the actual implementation guide, that there, there are some very specific texts and um, formats that fa parents would really like us to um, consider in the upcoming years, and that will also have a budgetary impact as we consider purchasing different texts and genres. So that will have an impact on the implementation guide. So as you will not see any you know, words or lines changed from that curriculum to this one, we will have, we anticipate the impact on the implementation guide. Okay. Um, and my last question is sort of two parts, and then the rest I'll get back to you. Um, the elementary schools in Fairfield are also following the, are working in data teams, correct? Yes. Do they? <laughs> Love the term, I know. Um, and I'm curious, what, what have they been, to what degree, I, I don't know, are they completely self-directed in their data teams? Are they getting any direction from central office? How much of it is focused on, because I'm, I'm interested in what you're saying when you're piloting parts of it, and I'm curious about if you sort of connected to the data teams, maybe or maybe not. Um, if you could give an example of something that you tried, didn't work, it didn't work, and you therefore changed. Um. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to have to get back to you on that because I know I'll either screw it up or draw, so I guess I'm drawing a blank. But I know there were um, some uh, teacher resources written that have been reconsidered by the teachers and have asked to be uh, altered and changed. And I, I don't want to misquote it and somebody say, I thought you said it was a summarizing unit. And um, right, I'm thinking of the writers' units, the writing units of study. We did some major changes too because we floated them out there and some revisions were needed. Um, yeah, I, I'd be more comfortable getting, I don't want to get them wrong, but um, yes, teachers have said certain things work better than others. And we can usually tell by what the children are giving back to us. Thank you. Can I address the data team issue sure. a little bit? Um, because that's something that's happening at all levels. It's not just an elementary, it's not just a language arts. Um, but just as, um, Kids learn how to continue them, so do schools. <laughs> and so um, schools are in different places. Um, we spent a tremendous amount of time this summer with the administrative team and they and then with their teachers on um, developing school improvement plans using a school improvement team. And we developed, wasn't handed to them by central office, collaboratively a common format for school improvement plans um, that has assessments built into it. Um, and I'll be sharing some more with you between now and the next meeting about that. Um, and each school then started in the process of looking at their school-wide data and using school-wide data teams. Some schools and grade levels also um, were able to do that at the grade level or the subject area data teams. Um, so they're all in a little different place around it. Um, we've had quite a bit of PD with the administrators. We even had, right in this very room, a little mock data team with role play by the principals. And we all sat around and observed a data team in action and critiqued it. So there are standards for the data teams. Um, the s principals have um, sort of assessed where they are with that. And they've all made a really good faith effort to implement that this year. Um, some are farther along than others. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the um, probably more exciting elements of some of the new folks we have bringing on board in the elementary level is all of them have experience with data teams. Uh, I think it's going to be a real strength they're bringing to the to the district. So that's going to be ongoing work for several years. Um, in fact, I watched one today at Sherman on math and all these assessments. You know, the assessment data is out there. And language arts, we've seen them in action where those assessments that Mrs. Brand mentioned, you know, they look at those. Here's how our kids did. 
here's how the district did, here's how we compared, here's the different elements of it, here's where we're not as strong, what can we do? And then they're going back to their school improvement plans based on that data and revising what their strategies were based on that. So it's ongoing, um, but this was really year one of it. And as you know, any, <laughs> any initiative in year one is going to have its uh, bumps in the road. We're gonna, it, it's going to be a continuous work. It was part of the district improvement plan that I presented you know, a year ago. And um, <coughs> so that's a long-winded answer. But it's much bigger than language arts and, and elementary. Um, that it's, it's ongoing, and uh, people are really working well with it. That's where it is right now. But I'll have a better update for you, and I'll have some samples that I can share with the board before the next meeting, because that's on my agenda. Mrs. Brand? Yeah. yeah just one thought. I, I, I think the timeline that we look at when we're doing this is inherent in, in curriculum um, discussion approval, is that the timeline's so tight. As Mr. Liu and Mrs. Kennelly have said, it becomes problematic for the board to actually decide not. It's unusual. But perhaps the way to address it is to address the board the same way you did the parents with a focus group, meaning if the board gets the material and reads it and sends it your thoughts, I think it, it would actually um, provide the opportunity for them to have a sense of where you're coming from, share their thoughts with you, and then ultimately when it gets here, there probably would be less questions and a better uh, appreciation of um, the direction you're going in. That would be my suggestion. Thank you for your feedback. I just want to thank you. And um, the board does tend to ask challenging questions on curriculum. Please don't take that as us not appreciating the work that you do. We sincerely do. And um, we thank you for all of your efforts. This will be a um, voting item at the next meeting. Um, we are on to student committee liaison reports. Does anybody have anything they need to report on at the table at this time? Mrs. Brand. Just a couple of things because I, I know it has been ongoing in the district. Is that June 3rd that we will have um, resolution as to what qualifies for curricular and extracurricular activities, and that will help clarify the medical coverage. Also relevant for the budget issue, to date the health department director is moving forward as is with what it, the plan is. If the um, th this, uh, first selectman deems it necessary to do cutbacks, it may be something that is brought to the Board of Health. But at this time, the health department, um, medical advisor, and the school nurses are still on track. But I thought it was important because I knew people heard that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Kennelly. Uh, just briefly, just to remind uh, the board, and Mr. Dwyer, correct me if I've got the dates wrong, that we will be going to the policy committee um, that first Monday in June with the handbook, which has had a few major changes in terms of language um, based upon our last full board meeting, and that when we bring it back, it will be for a read and then a vote. And so just please carefully peruse it so that we can, you know, bring up any issues that we need to and, uh, you know, move that along. But it has been looked over. Uh, Dr. Title spent a good amount of time with it and his staff. So is that putting it all right, Mr. Dry? So when you do get that. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Dr. Title. Well, I gave my report to four okay. new principals. Thank you. I'm going to conserve my voice. All right. <laughs> um, and we're on to old business, um, which is the approval of the technology <laughs> education curriculum. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the technology education curriculum grades 7 through 12. Moved by. Mrs. Kennelly, seconded by Mrs. Brand. Is there any discussion? Mr. Convertito. One, well, I'd just like uh, to thank uh, those involved for, the, again, the, the feedback on um, and the changes that were sent to us on the 18th of May. Um, I'm, go I'm going to vote in favor of the curriculum, but I'm, I'm still having an issue with how we are assessing how our professionals and, and staff are. That's, that's a different one. With technical education? No, we're on the technology curriculum. Oh, I'm sorry. Then I have no question. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any public comment? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Carey. I apologize. Just, just a, a quick comment um, related to this. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank the staff for the uh, uh, tremendous uh, display that you put on uh, in front of the. Uh, a board meeting last week, and I was uh, or last time, and I was captivated by it. 
and a suggestion that I'd like to make, I know we don't have a PR committee anymore, but something like that potentially at a RTM meeting in the future so that um, our representatives who uh, uh, kindly fund the school district can see some of the material results of, of what is done, I think would be a suggestion I'd like to make uh, to the board, to our team, is I think that the more we can show um, the benefits of this funding, uh, the better we're going to be in the future. Excellent. Thank point. you. Okay. Is there any public comment on this item and this item only? Seeing none, all in favor? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Next item on our agenda is the naming of North Stratfield Elementary School. Recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the naming of the North Stratfield Elementary School fifth grade wing in honor of Mrs. Nancy Hanlon. Uh, moved by Mrs. Gerber, seconded by Mr. Carey. Is there any discussion? We will take public comment on this. I just want to say it's looking pretty good. If there's just one person who wants to speak, feel free. I don't think you need to line a lot of people up at the microphone. That's called don't talk past the sale. <laughs> all right. Seeing none, all in favor? Congratulations. Motion passes unanimously. Um, naming. Oh, I'm sorry, I almost skipped over C. Naming of the Stratfield Elementary School Library Media Center. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve naming the Stratfield Elementary School Media Center, uh, Center in honor of Mr. Tom Pache. Moved by Mrs. Kennelly, seconded by Mr. Dwyer. Is there any board discussion? Is there any public comment? <laughs> I would have to say yes. I won't hold you back. Feel free to speak. Don't, you know. Okay. Seeing none, um, is the board prepared to vote then? All in favor? Passes unanimously. Congratulations, everybody. Um, next item approval of policy 3901, naming of facilities. Recommend a motion that the Board of Education approve policy number 3901, naming of facility. Moved by Mrs. Brand, seconded by Mr. Carey. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Canelli. I'm just curious about board feedback. The one sticking point to me within this policy was the minimum wait period of three years. Um, we, that was one of the briefest of discussions when we were going over this, as some of us were making additions. Um, I have to admit I was more in favor of one year. I, we moved it forward out of policy, but that's the one topic I'd be curious about board feet reflecting on before we take the vote. Uh, Mr. Carey and then Mr. Dwyer. Uh, just uh, from my perspective, I'm comfortable with that. I think giving a, a little bit of uh, a space and birth um, between the time. You're comfortable with the three? The three years, okay. yeah. Uh, uh, with the time someone leaves the district, retires, what have you. Um, I think that that uh, allows you to have a little more perspective, and uh, I'm not uncomfortable with that at all. Mr. Dwyer. Um, I am also comfortable with it. I, I uh, am glad that we moved the uh, Mr. Convertito's suggestion that we move on the two uh, suggestions that were made before we vote on this new policy. Uh, I, I do think that by waiting three years, we ensure that the honor is truly an honor and not just a response that, okay, my principal is retiring or so and so, and so I, I guess we have to do it because the other elementary school had to do it. So I'm comfortable. I, I guess the only thing that would make me uncomfortable is if, if uh, staff told us that uh, once retired, most of our staff move out of town. They move away. They're, they go down south or whatever they do, uh, and that therefore if we wanted to honor them, it would be more difficult. I'm assuming that, for the most part, they stay in town, they stay in the area, and that we would be able to honor them three years later because of that. It's a good excuse to get them back. Mr. Convertito. Uh, I, I, too, am in favor, um, although, Mr. Dwyer, if you listen to the RTM, everybody over the age of 62 is fleeing the town. Um, <laughs> 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 the taxes. <laughs> shoot one across the bow. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
we, we had a lot of discussion on that, and, and I can tell you, um, the, the two that we heard uh, or have heard in the last month, you know, th there was a great deal of emotion there, and there were people there that um, that I got letters from whose kids were never even, you know, in those schools, but were they were in those environments and, and knew those people, and, and and I think that type of um, passion w would still exist um, three years from now, even if we had had. Uh, not moved on on the two previous ones, uh, so I, I'm comfortable with the three years. I think it stops us from getting into a, a knee-jerk reaction type of si uh, a situation where we're naming things immediately, um, and, uh, and I, I just think it, it's a it's a good cooling off period. If there was you know extenuating circumstance, then you know to me the, the superintendent would still have the option to bring it to us and ask us to waive the rules. Um, uh, on, on, on that type of situation. So uh, I'm comfortable with that, that, that time frame. Seeing no further discussion, is there any public comment? Okay, all in favor of this policy? Passes unanimously. Next item, approval of the technology plan. Recommend now, we now, now we're ready, Mr. Convertito. <laughs> Not yet, though. <laughs> Almost. Um, recommend a motion that the Board of Education approve the technology plan July 1st, 2012 through June 30th, 2015, which is enclosure number four. Moved by uh, Mr. Convertito, seconded by Mrs. Gerber. Discussion on this item. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Parks here, maybe. Would you like to just, just describe take us the, the changes highlights? that you made between sure. the board feedback and now? Maybe that would be a good start. And then yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, since the last meeting, there were several questions, um, which I addressed one in a memo, and then um, we decided that um, some of the sec suggestions were excellent <laughs> and that we should probably incorporate in them in the plan. So what I sent to you were the two goals that would be impacted by those suggestions. And one was um, goal three. And you should see in your packet, although I can't seem to find it now. I was just looking at it, where we added, thanks, Gary. In the highlighted yellow, there were questions about, um, ex in fact, there were many questions about how we surveyed the staff um, to determine their proficiency in the use of technology and how we used that information. Um, there were suggestions. We've used surveys in the past, and there were questions about how the survey th from three years ago was different from the survey um, that we used the past year. And uh, I explained in the memo that the survey that we used previously was very generic and sort of asked teachers in a very general way wh how, what they deemed their proficiency to be. And in the survey that we, um, we recently administered, there was actually a list of skills that the teachers could check off in terms of where they were, which is a little more moving towards more of a rubric that actually defined the type of skill. Um, but I think the board communicated pretty loudly and clearly that that may not be enough. Um, so what, we, what we're trying to do is, um, and we've added to this goal, that we'd like to try to develop a more effective tool um, that actually is a rubric that allows us teachers to actually measure their proficiency in a large range of areas. And we could take those from the uh, international technology standards to try to develop the rubric and share that, that can be part of the plan. So we've added um, in goal three, which is um, connecting teaching and learning, uh, the development of a rubric to better assess the proficiency of our staff members and give us better feedback on where we can specifically provide professional development to help advance their proficiency. And then the second area was on the fifth goal, which is about productivity and efficiency and in the use of technology, uh, using technology to improve your productivity and efficiency of teaching and learning. And um, that was where we um, added 
research and implement distance learning to improve the efficiency of time, the use of staff, and the facilitation of student learning. And again, that was came out of a discussion at the board at the last meeting. Um, and we felt it um, actually was worthy of, of researching in multiple ways how we could, could do that. And so that is, as you can see, an added um, item on, under the fifth goal. Excellent. Thank you very much for incorporating that. Um, Welcome. Does anybody have any follow-up? Mr. Fadabeen. I guess one, uh, I guess, concern of mine, in your memo um, of May 11th, item one mm -hmm. related to the data, uh, data plans, mm -hmm. um, I probably would not be in agreement approaching data plans for any students. I think that we have a wireless system within the schools and that should provide some access. I, I just of the opinion that the school system should not purchase data plans for personal devices of, in use by students. And, and incur that cost. Um, so I would not be in favor of that aspect if I understand your memo correctly that in some cases data plans would be purchased for students. Uh, did you want to respond? Uh, I, I, I just voiced my concern of I would not be in agreement with yeah. no, hold, hold I just on. would not be in agreement with the district purchasing data plans for students. Okay. Did you want to address that, Mrs. Parks, or would yeah. you like me to recognize I, Mr. I'll Curry? try. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, the intent is certainly not to broad scale purchase data plans for students, but um, there are some, currently we are um, piloting the use of some tablets. We, there are so many different devices out there that we're trying to determine which devices may work best in certain situations um, for teaching and learning. So um, we are doing some pilots and um, the reason that we're, we've purchased data plans is because the kids will take them home. Part of it is going to be for use in summer school where we're pi piloting them in language arts. Um, and in this pilot, we're really just de determining if the device is actually effective for the application that we're trying. Um, if we decide that, that those devices work well in that application, then we, when we finish the pilot, we would not purchase the data plans for students because they would be expected to either use their own device or if they didn't have a device, we might recommend what device. We're, we're trying to pilot for bring your own device. Um, so any student who brings their own device would use their own data plan, but if we did have kids that couldn't afford the device, for example, we may have to purchase some data plans with those devices because the idea is that students would use them, they'd have 24-hour access. So, um, and I think we'd have that responsibility if we expected them to have 24-hour access and they didn't have that availability at home. Mr. Carey. Just on uh, Mr. Fadimi's point, I think I came into this when I first read the plan and had a similar thought that um, the, the practical reality or even just the optics of purchasing data plans for all our students would be a, um, a non-starter with the other town boards. I think in this situation, though, um, as I understood and listened to uh, Ms. Burns, um, there's another responsibility the district has here with the equipment that we're providing. And when the students are on school grounds, they're able to filter the information that's being seen by our students through our Wi-Fi network. So through the SIPA Act, the Children and Internet Protection Act, when they leave our property, um, there would be no control on what the students could see on that device. However, through, as I understood what Mrs. Burns said, and please correct me if I'm wrong, through this Verizon data plan that they're, they're trialing just for the, get the idea of which tablets they're using, they're able to get the filtering and therefore provide that protection for our students and not create another potential liability issue for the district. So I think that there's more to it than just the actual data plan itself, but making sure that what our students are viewing when they're off property with a device that's owned by the district. Um, is being filtered appropriately. That's correct. Okay. Uh, 
um, Mr. Lynn and Mr. Convertito. Uh, uh, just to be clear, what, what um, Mr. Fadimine, but was your point not so much to content, but was also to price? I, I, I'm just I, I think it's a dangerous policy to where one would decide on purchasing data plans for students. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a slippery slope and dangerous policy and one in which I don't think is appropriate and one in which I think if you're talking about access to information in the internet, certainly while they're in school and on school grounds, you can have a Wi-Fi system that provides them access to everything the data plan would give. So the data plan is only going to be useful after school hours to those students. And I think it's a dangerous policy and precedent to set in some situations we're going to give people in data plans and some other people not data plans. And I think it's ex outside, um, in essence, those data plans are only useful outside of school grounds, in essence, because they have adequate resources and availability while in school to access all that information under a Wi-Fi system. So I just think it's, it's an extra cost to the district. It's going to be difficult policing. It's going to be difficult implementing. And I think it's a dangerous precedent to set and will cause problems in the future. And that's why I don't think it's a good policy to implement. May I ask for clarification? Yes. The purchase of the data plan, is that only for the pilot program outside of if you move forward, there might be students who have financial needs that we would need to assist with. But, but in regards to this particular document in front of us, the data plan, is that only for the pilot program? Yes. How many students are involved in the pilot program? We have a pilot with two classes of 25. So it's 50 tablets provided through Verizon in two separate classes. So we're working with two teachers and two classes that are using them. So there's data plans for those. Um, and uh, they'll be using them in the summer as well. And how is, so there's a start date and an end date for this pilot program, I presume? Yes. And I can't give you the specific dates, but yes, it's a, it's a trial. It's uh, part of, uh, I think Verizon is also trying to break into the education market. So you wouldn't, <laughs> so it would be about a year, oh, six, some, six months to a year that you would be spending money on, the, on a data plan for this particular pilot, longer, shorter? Uh, I think it's probably shorter than a year. Okay. Um, I, I'm, not, I'd, I'm not sure it goes much past the fall, but I'd have to check on that for you. Okay. And then you would be finished with purchasing data plans aside from, obviously, yes. financial uh, needs. Part of the reason we're piloting different tools, different devices, is because there's real pressure to move towards bring your own device. When you bring your own device, you have your own data plan. Um, but there's a lot of controversy over which devices work better for different applications. So we're trying to, through language arts, determine which devices are cost effective for electronic reading but have access to the internet as well so kids can check additional resources. So that's part of the reason we're using this in the pilot. So in essence, you need this particular piece, you need the data plan in order to find out whether or not the pilot, this program is going to work. Yes. Okay. So it's an essential component of what you're piloting. Yes. What I'm trying to yes, get is. out of my mouth. Yes. Okay. Thank you. For no, no commitment beyond that. Right. That for for right. that reason, I, I agree with, I have a big problem purchasing data plans for 10,010 students. In and the that district. was never the intent. Right. So uh, knowing that there is a specific parameter around it, you're piloting one program, there's a start date, there's an end date, you'll be finished with it. I'm comfortable knowing that and I fully appreciate the concern surrounding, um, you know, extending it past right. that. That that would right. clearly, I agree wholeheartedly, be a very dangerous precedent. Mrs. Brand and then Mr. Convertito. Um, I have a couple of things. One of the things I remember seeing, but I, for some reason I'm having trouble finding it in here, was that we were talking about distance learning. Yes. And using that. And I know it is done in some other school districts, I think more often than not by absolute necessity. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, are you going to be coming back to the board to um, present which model we're using so that 
I, I guess I have a concern that I want to see a model that has already been vetted that we know works. I just don't want to have students do this and have the experience that we had in the district in the past when we tried this and it tanked. Because yeah. um, those kids lost. They're the ones that really lost and I don't want to see that happen again. Um, the other thing that I, I um, have a concern about has to do with bring your own device. We may be going in that direction and if we're already doing a pilot, here's my concern, post haste. We need to have a policy addressing the parameters of appropriate and acceptable use. I know you told me we're working on it, but we're already there. Um, and I have concerns because it's, it, there's so much access that when you do this. And you're, we're trying to monitor it and making sure that we have um, everyone with a mutual understanding of what that means. But right now, we don't. And I think the person that, again, would take the hit with this would be the student. So in order to protect them, um, I think the sooner that that comes to this table, the better. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Mr. Convertito. Yeah, I just want to get clarification and, and follow up with uh, the chair on the, on the pilot program uh, for the data plan. The pilot program is to, is to make an assessment of, of whether a BYO a bring your own device program would be feasible. Is that why we're doing it? Not exactly. We're, um, we're trying to determine for different applications what devices would work best so that if at some point we make a recommendation, to, like it's like um, a graphing calculator. We recommend to students what particular graphing calculator to purchase to use in school. So if we were going to go with a particular electronic device, and ask kids to bring their own device, we would want to be able to at least recommend what device would work in a particular application. So that's what we're trying, because there's so many out there, we're just not really sure. But then we get back to the conundrum that uh, Member Fadabin brought up was, if we're going to recommend somebody use a tablet or a wireless device, mm -hmm. and they can't afford it, like they can't afford a graphing calculator, are we backing ourselves into a corner in which we, ha we have to supply that tablet as well as the data plan for it. Well, we would hopefully be moving in the direction of bringing your own device to save a substantial amount of money on devices that we wouldn't have to provide. So if we did had to have to provide them to some students who couldn't afford their, their own, I still think it would be a cost savings measure. That would be part of the cost-benefit analysis that we would, we would do when we would look to whether or not it's effective to bring your own device and still have to support students who couldn't bring their own. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any public oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, just one quick question regarding the um, research and implement distance learning to improve the efficiency of time, the addition to um, number five. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the assessment component. One, again, I or reiterate uh, Mrs. Brand's point that I'm sure you'll be looking at models that are already in practice now because I'd be very leery about the uh, idea of the summer school. Um, but again, I'd be curious about what the model was that, that we're following that. I was curious if this is something that would be used with students serving expulsion. And then third, I was curious if you could explain how do you see um, this distance learning reducing the number of students failing? Well, um, some of the things that we may be looking at um, in distance learning could be online courses that students might be able to take, uh, as well as a teacher video streamed course where the teacher was teaching to multiple classrooms, well, two classrooms across both high schools. Another area might be some type of um, credit recovery software, for example, that is individualized learning that um, teachers would oversee and work with students. So if, if that were used, it may allow students, let's say, uh, a student who has some gaps in their learning in, in Algebra 1, um, they could actually be practicing online outside of class and, and supporting you know, some of their learning outside of class and then getting the additional learning inside of class. So if we had something like that, we would expect it to 
um, shore up some of the deficiencies for students, at the, which is, as you know, as a high school teacher, it's hard to do implement um, a good intervention model at, at the high school level. So sometimes um, online learning can help that to some extent. So uh, that could be another area that's a, a type of distance learning. Mr. Dwyer. Um, I'm going to say I'm hopeful that these are tough questions but are not meant to discourage you from experimenting in technology. And I don't think our board is trying to discourage you from experimenting in technology because it changes so fast. Yeah. I, I probably will guess that 50 years from now, people will say, of course, <laughs> data plans are necessary. Just like 100 years ago, somebody said, you know, we ought to buy our students books. Um, <laughs> Our, uh, our community is getting more diverse, and so I think I would be, uh, I would not like to think that we set a policy that said, uh, bring your own and that's it. Um, and I don't mean just for those students who are perhaps qualifying for free lunch, but if you've got two or three students in school and you are just scraping by because you want your children to have a Fairfield education, but you would, do not have a lot of discretionary income. Um, I'd like to think that our board would have an ability to recognize that diversity. And I guess the third thing I'd, uh, I would say that, uh, yes, optics, I guess, is, is the same thing as saying, will this fly, will this sell? Uh, I, I would hope that we would first ask the question, uh, is this of educational value? And if we then decided it was, then how do we best sell it? rather than put the sales question first. Uh, uh, and, and I know that's not what Mr. Kerry meant, but I just felt that I wanted to say that I think that's what the board needs to do as a board of education. We are not the RTM. We are not the board of finance. We are the board of education. Thank you. Mr. Kerry. So um, to a few of the points I heard, I, I think that what you will find, and I heard uh, Mrs. Parks say it, um, when you start to look at these types of initiatives in technology, and this has been proven out time and again in the private sector, um, you will see huge dollar savings. So um, the, the ability to um, prop up uh, the students that will need that help, I think, will be realized in, in the money the district will save and the efficiency the district gains. Um, but I do want to thank the district and share with you all a real brief story because I know the hour is late. I was having a conversation with my business partner last week who's got a two and a half year old at home and uh, he inherited my children's wooden kitchen where you, know, you can do the cooking on the stove and you have the all the wonderful things and this particular kitchen has a old-fashioned wooden telephone with the cord wrapping around it, you know, like the old rotary dial type phones, but the cord comes off so the you know, child doesn't get hung up in it. And what she does is she runs around the house with the phone to take pictures of everyone. <laughs> because that's what you do with the phone is you take pictures, right? So uh, I do want to thank our team for the effort in, in adding particularly the, the, the measurement tools so that we can keep track of where our educators are and help them because they're going to have to catch up with all those two and a half year olds who are taking pictures <laughs> with their toy phones right now. So thank you very much for uh, all the hard work on this. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item and this item only? Please state your name and address. In, indeed for the there is. Uh, Ken Lee, 71 Rota Avenue. Um, as a person who's been in technology all his life, I think this is great stuff. Um, I'll just share with you two things. Yesterday I went to the D.A.R.E. graduation at uh, Sherman School. Um, and one of the things, of course, that they discuss in the D.A.R.E. program is bullying and mostly to do with electronic devices because we all know that's, that's in the old days you used to get out in the schoolyard and, and you got the tar beat out of you. And it, after a while you learned when you saw uh, Butch coming you went the other way and you could avoid it. And in the electronic age, that's no longer possible. So, you know, speaking to your concern, Mr. Kerry, I agree. You know, that idea of filtering is important and, and all of that stuff. And 
I'm sure that we're going to get to the point where um, there's going to be a lot of this. Speaking as a member of another of the town boards, however, I have to caution you that there will be no uh, great uh, outcry uh, in support of this kind of activity. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. I'm, I'm just saying that, first of all, we have to understand where it saves us money. In other words, if we buy, if we have a tablet and the student has a tablet, um, does it replace a book? And what is the, what is the cost benefit of that, first of all? Um, I know we don't like to talk about that, but even I'd have trouble supporting that. I don't have an iPad. Fifth graders don't need an iPad. Um, what does it do that, that our PC and our notebook and our phone doesn't do? That's another concern. Um, and, and the big concern for me is, is just propagating these things even more than they already are. Um, the idea that a kid has to have an electronic device that works while he's downtown, Hi, Mr. Lee. not so good. So that's just my two cents worth. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further discussion from the board? All in favor? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you, everybody thank who worked you. on this plan. New business. Uh, yep. Approval of the budget adjustments for the 2012-2013 year. Recommend a motion that the Board of Education adopt, approve, I'm sorry, a budget adjustments for 2012-2013 as outlined in enclosure number five. I'm fighting the use of my glasses, can you tell? Approved by Mr. Dwyer, <laughs> seconded by Mrs. Gerber. Discussion. Walk through this or at all? Um, or sure. I want to talk about why, it. Don't, why don't we have Mr. I'm sorry, Dr. <coughs> Title walk us through just the highlights of this and then we'll take board questions. Okay. And I'll be brief so I have to go get some cod liver oil. <laughs> rescue my voice. Um, the top half of the document is Mrs. Munsell's attempt to reconcile all the different changes as it went through the town bodies. <laughs> so we started with a budget request of 149, 464, 941, and the RTM approved budget is 148, 936, 464. Everything between those two numbers at the top is basically the ins and outs that it went through. While there's a lot of attention that was spent, obviously, on the $250,000 cut, the board also needs to balance off the 278,477 cut that was made in recognition of the pension obligations being less than the board budgeted. So the board needs to take action on the pension, but that was something that was pretty much agreed upon and expected that would happen. But technically, the bodies can't tell you where to put it, so you need to confirm that. It's a wise move, but I just that's why that's there, uh, to balance this off. Really try to make these adjustments as low impact as possible, um, and that um, we would do our best um, to absorb these within the appropriation. There had been some new information um, that had come in between the time the budget was approved and now that allows us to reduce some lines without changing any services at all. In other cases, we'll redeploy resources. But as many of the speakers at the RTM and others said, you know, a $250,000 um, cut should be able to be absorbed in a $149 million budget without a major um, impact. And um, I think we can do that. Um, the cuts are before you. And um, I think this, uh, you know, this is the end, if you approve, of a very long budget process. Uh, I'm very thankful to only have to give you a list of $250,000 worth of cuts. Um, because the potential of going through what we went through last year was looming. And it was not going to be particularly inviting. So the fact that it sort of ends this way is reassuring. I also think that the board received a lot of kudos for the budget process from a lot of the town bodies about the conservative nature of the budget. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, the other bodies respected that, which is why our cut was relatively uh, modest. So in honor of that, I really felt that we would be able to move forward on all of our initiatives that we discussed during the budget process. The 
improvement of the elementary special ed staffing model, the additional resources for struggling learners in math at the middle school and the high school, the purchase of the student information system, um, additional staff for the burgeoning enrollment that we have at, at the high schools, um, not having to scale those programs back, but being able to keep uh, class sizes where they are. Um, all of the initiatives uh, that were in the budget, we're able to move forward with, um, even after you adopt these, if you adopt these recommendations. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I just want to take a moment too and thank the <laughs> board um, for being unified in front of the budget and for all of us appearing and standing behind the budget and helping to foster it through the process. I really appreciate the efforts that everybody made to go to meetings and take the time out and to really see this through. As you know, once we adopt it, we own it. And um, I do thank you for putting in the extra time to be there. Um, and I want to just thank the um, community as well for coming out and really um, getting vocal about what it was that they wanted for education and making their voice heard um, to the RTM um, when our budget was before them. Um, everybody really went above and beyond for things that they cared about and, and we saw that as a board and we thank you. Um, and with that, um, we will have a discussion on how to reduce our budget by $250,000. Anybody want to? open anything up. Mrs. Brand. Yeah, um, through you to Dr. Title. when I look at this and you look at 250000 I too am very thankful and appreciative that we're not dealing with something much more significant. That said, I, would you mind um, to go through and say pension town adjustment, what when we see enrollment projection 10,000 delay mm -hmm. comprehensive update, I think someone might read this and think it has little impact. I think what I'd like to hear is, as you go down the line, what impact this is going to have on the district, because otherwise it might look, since we're moving forward, that it doesn't have much of one. And I, I want to be clear that it still does, in, in my, my opinion, but I want to make sure that we all have a mutual understanding of what that is, if you'd be kind enough. Well, I do want to say that, that generally these were considered to be low impact as opposed to no impact. Right, so right. So the enrollment projection, um, we carried uh, if you remember, um, last year we did a very comprehensive, new, and fairly pricey enrollment projection for 10 years. This year, uh, we carried a figure of $5,000 to simply do a one-year update. Um, next year, we had anticipated perhaps re-engaging that firm to do a more comprehensive update to the 10-year one they did. Um, that was the increase. So this line was going from 5000 to 15,000. So now it will revert back to 5,000, and we will do another one year update. So we will get a enrollment update. Uh, we'll just delay um, a more comprehensive update to another year. So I think the impact of that is fairly minimal, but I think you can expect in the near future to see this line go back up to the 15,000. Um, there's some additional census data that's coming out fairly soon, but I'm not exactly sure when and so putting this off by a year I don't think is a big issue. Okay. So that's that's what we're giving us. We're not we, we are still going to do an enrollment update. I want to say that. We're just not going to do as comprehensive a one as we would have had we had the additional money. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, I, okay. I, I think that was in terms of our long term planning for <laughs> facilities it may have an impact. So that's why I want to be clear that there is a purpose behind these. Yes. Yep. Um Anybody else have a question? I had one. Okay, Mr. Convertier. I have, there's one line that I have a, a big issue with, and I'm going to ask you if, if there's an alternative to it. Since November, I have seen, actually I've lost count, whether it's five or six new curriculums being rolled out in front of us. Um, and you have uh, professional development being cut by nearly $25,000, $24,000. I'm loath to make that reduction knowing the curriculum rollouts and, and what that effect is going to have. I'm going to have Dr. Rosado address that. Um, because that, that a couple people um, sent some emails in, in around that, and clearly if we thought this was going to be a major detriment to implementing any of the new curriculum, we wouldn't have it on the, on the list. But um, Dr. Rosado, can you address that for sure. the board, please? Sure. 
The, uh, the lines that we're talking about are on page 73 in the budget book. And basically, they, uh, they target 13, the, the 13 program areas in the district. What happens when we build the budget is I meet with each one of those curriculum coordinators or, or uh, curriculum leaders to develop the budget that they need. If you look at the lines um, on page 73, it says professional development as the category, but I want to remind you that in there is professional development and curriculum development. So it's a, it's a sort of a combination in the program implementation lines. Many of them, the reduction that we're looking at here is just a, a few hundred dollars, actually, to what they were requesting. So that's an important piece to know. The numbers are not that large for most of the areas. We're talking three, five hundred dollars of a reduction from what they requested. Um, the bigger areas are, um, th that we're looking at in terms of a larger reduction would be math and language arts. But still, the number that's in the budget is, is actually quite substantial. So the, imp the impact is the, the calendar that we have and that's in the budget book actually has helped us quite a bit. Um, we've prioritized where our needs are. So what I've done in anticipation of this reduction is start to meet with each one of these curriculum folks and say, OK, we need to reduce this by $500. What impact will that have? Let's take a look at what you were looking to do in the summer, next school year. Let's see if we can pair that back. And basically what we've been talking about is reducing perhaps the number of teachers or the amount of time, perhaps an hour or two here or there, to, to cut back to, to meet the reduction that we're looking at here. So, Reducing the amount of time that teachers are working on curriculum this summer. It might be instead of five days, perhaps four days in a particular program area. That's how we would handle that. Um, some of the units of study, we were going to be developing a number of assessments, perhaps scaling that back. And so each one of them have been meeting with me to say, okay, this is if we need to cut back $500, $800, let's take a look at what that's going to look like. Um, but I have to say that the calendar of renewals and next year we're really bringing two programs forward. That's math and, and language arts um, in particular grade levels. Um, we can cut back in some of the, uh, the other areas without a major impact in what they're going to be doing. So it's spread out over a it's, lot of areas. It's so spread over when 13. you aggregate it, it looks like a pretty big number. Mm -hmm. But when you spread it out, divide it by 13, spread that out between professional development and curriculum development, um, right. the impact is pretty small. But just when you put all the numbers together, um, anyway, that's uh, I, the explanation. Uh, I understand. I mean, believe me, I'm, I'm actually, I was so thankful that people actually asked about this one. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's, I, it's definitely I'm, a, a good I, one. You know, we don't want to do this willy nilly. It's not just, oh, we've got a big number there, let's just cut it. Um, so, you know, we, we don't want to jeopardize the, the professional development. Um, at all, but um, you know some of the costs in professional development. It's not direct dollar costs like in these line items. It's how much can we pull teachers out of classes to give them PD. That's the real cost, mm -hmm. and there's only so much of that you really can do. Mm -hmm. So, um, our, and and a lot of our professional development because we have people on staff, they're doing it. We're not paying direct dollars out for right. it. So there's lots and lots of PD that goes on that right. doesn't show up in the PD line. Um, and so that's, I understand the concern, but if you think of it as being spread out among a lot of content areas, it's really pretty minimal. Of that 24,000, how much was planned to be expended between July 1 and September 1? Well, the, 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 the total for all of those lines. And, and let, me, uh, let me just follow it up, because my, my, I guess my follow-up um, or second part to that is, should we get that additional retiree before June 30th, would right. this be replaced back? Yeah, so we, yeah, that's the other point, is we have some flexibility here. Right. I mean, if we get to the point where we need to spend a little bit more in this area, or, you know, one more day or a few more hours, um, we have the flexibility within accounts, you know, to, yeah. to mm -hmm. move the money. We can't move, a, you know, big amounts around. Obviously, that takes your, you know, approval. But, um, yeah, if, um, if, we, if we, this is not all spent in the summer. I don't know how much of it is. You know, a fair amount of it is. but. Um, there would be plenty of opportunity to recoup this over the course of the year if something went, you know, better than expected. So I'm not, I'm not worried that if we really need to spend a little extra on PD, I think we could get it done. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer and then Mrs. Brandt. Yeah, I, I was uh, one of the emails on professional development. Um, I put that in the same category as maintenance. It's the last to cut, and uh, and so I. Uh, then stood back and said 250,000 on 145 million. That really is management figuring out how to s shave that small amount 
um, if you will. Um, and the second thing I assume is that not a single person from senior management will say we weren't able to advance the curriculum because of professional development. Right. Um, and that they will spend what they need to do right. to achieve the goals that they've promised us. Um, actually, when I asked earlier, perhaps I wasn't being clear, I was saying, for instance, actually what I wanted you to do, um, Dr. Tyler, if you would, is to very briefly, because I know your voice is failing, what I want to look at when we're talking about the description is what we're giving up. Now, we've already spoken to professional development, we've already talked about the comprehensive um, enrollment projections, but there are pieces in here, for instance, the fuel tanks. And, right. and what I was trying to say, it, I think what I want to have demonstrated is that this is still a sacrifice, but when we have it written down with description, it isn't necessarily apparent to everyone what that sacrifice is. So I was asking if you could just speak to it briefly so we understand what the impact is. Sure. Thank you. Um, something like fuel tanks is really not an impact because when they built the budget, we had no assurance <laughs> that the... Um, that the town was going to agree to our capital project of removing the fuel tanks and putting in the day tanks. So we had to build the budget assuming that we were still going to be maintaining these underground tanks because, you know, sometimes these things don't get passed. I mean, this year everything passed, but once the, they agreed to that, now the maintenance required on a day tank above ground is substantially right. less. So there was a, a change in circumstance from when the budget was put together to the end that allows us to continue the maintenance of the fuel tanks, but because they're above ground, they require a lot less um, manpower and therefore doesn't cost as much. Tom, how'd I do? Okay, good. Um, the um, recycling one, basically what Tom and his team um, have been working on is if we simply stagger and do less of the recycling pickup in the summer, uh, we save a substantial amount of money. Um, so that um, recyclables may pile up a bit at the schools, but um, we switched over to this and it saves a huge amount of time. So when we have recycling in the summer, we call and they come get it, as opposed to every week, every school having right. the truck go around, that costs you a lot of money. Um, so it's really an efficiency. Um, and as, you know, if, if a school really has a lot of recycling over a summer for whatever reason, we can just call and have a pickup made. Right. But it puts a burden on us to actually go and request the service as opposed to automatically it comes, it comes around. Um, the technical consulting, that's professional services that Tom uses often in advance of projects that we're going to present, say, to the RTM. Like, for example, we hired um, Phil Cerrone to do some preliminary work on the Riverfield project. Mm -hmm. right? um, you know, we would just scale that back. Um, I don't know that we have a lot left because, again, most of the stuff we got passed. So we don't see the need for this as much. But it, it was helpful to have some technical help on a lot of these projects that we brought forward to the town. Um, we'll just do a little bit less of it. The student information software was just, um, you know, the, the budget number was a cost, was a placeholder. Um, the actual bid for the actual product, the real number came in at right. 203000 instead of two fifty, And so, yeah. you know, we're just acknowledging uh, savings there. Um, other contracted services are very minimal. Um, I think there's much to say about that. PD, um, the paper, Jan just is working to work her magic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we think that um, in working with the town, we can also we can cut down our volume a bit and get better pricing. So I don't, we're, we're not going to run out of paper. There will be enough paper. Um, and um, Andrea uh, Leonardi, um, has done such a masterful job with her budget this year. If you remember, a special ed budget typically is over. Um, this year, the year we're in now, remember the board pushed last year hard, the board members that were here, to fund that at the appropriate level. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually worked. And so um, some grant money that we had previously, you know, thought we might have to use to um, spend um, hasn't been necessary. So we're going to buy the assistive technology, but we can use grant funds from one year to the next to do it. So that'll be fine. And then the retirements are what they are. Um, if we have additional, any additional retirements, though, um, well, I'd love to then just turn around and spend it on PD. Um, we also have unknown expenses for staff. It could happen in the middle of the summer. And we have no reserve fund, as I explained to the RTM. 
Um, you know, we don't have a reserve of fountain. We don't have that. Um, I know, for example, we need a couple more teachers at the high school because of enrollment and course taking patterns. We don't have a reserve fund for that, so additional retirements will help pay for that kind of unanticipated expense in staff um, that we don't know when we put the budget together. And as a, as a follow-up to that, uh, <coughs> and I'm sure you're already doing this, can you just, because I know the question's going to come up at the RTM next year, should we exceed our retirement number? Can you just keep a, a, a track of where we put that money, so to say? Sure. Um, and that way we can answer the question when it gets asked. Right. No problem. A year from now. Um, Ms. Mr. Comertito and then Mrs. Canelli. Go ahead. Oh, no. Um, well, first of all, thank you for bringing up the issue of professional development. That was my issue as well. Um, I do have one question about the teacher retirement, though. Um, it's spoken at the RTM level um, in an almost blasé manner. If you get more retirements, it means more money. But if you look at the pay scale, that $35,000, there's presupposing that you're bringing in an inexperienced teacher. And for us to be able to put that number on there, do we actually have a policy or a central office directive that teachers or administrators or guidance can only be hired if they're up to a certain step? Because if the most qualified person right. has 10, 12, 15 years of experience, then this is an unrealistic sum. Right. So what, um, we have a guideline, but um, if we don't have a qualified individual who's, um, uh, you know, at the lower end of the pay scale, we have and I have hired people at the top of the pay scale. So what this represents is an average of the savings that one would get from multiple retirements. Um, if you actually have somebody retire at the very top and someone is hired at BA1, that savings is well in excess of 35000 okay? So this represents that some people are hired at step one, but not all. Some are going to be hired and there'll be no savings. Some will be hired, there'll be 50000 So in the wash of all of it, um, we do hire experienced people. Um, but, um, you know, in certain areas, you really have little choice. I mean, there are certain shortage areas, uh, hard to fill positions, where, um, you know, you just have to. Um, there's other areas where it's not necessary um, and where we have really qualified people that are, that are new or come in with just a few years' experience. So um, it's, it's an estimate, and you're right. I mean, that's one of the risks is, you know, that number might not materialize because the retirements could be in areas that we don't save much money. Uh, but our experience, and Margaret Mary's vast experience over time, is this is how it averages out. Um, and, and so we don't sacrifice the quality, um, but this is what it tends to be. But, and that's another reason why if we had four additional retirements, you know, it won't take four, you know, because sometimes you don't get that savings. Right. You know, it's a crystal ball kind of a thing based on experience of, of what you save on the average. It's not that every single retirement yields you 35000 yeah, You mentioned the guideline. Right. What, what is our guideline? Well, we, we try to hire people in at MA1 if we can. Um, but that's often exceeded. So um, it's not a hard and fast, you can never do it, but um, that's what we kind of shoot for. Um, but it's highly dependent on supply and demand, really is. Um, yeah, there's certain areas where if somebody retires, I can virtually guarantee you we're going to be bringing someone in on step 10 or step 12 or step 15. Um, it just happens. You have a just, just to clarify, um, the Superintendent Smart, we don't have any policy based on age when it comes to hiring. There's teachers. no policy. Okay. No, and it would be illegal, in my view, to have such a policy. That's correct. There is no policy. All right. Is there, uh, Mr. Fatterby? Just real quick on this teacher retirement sort of clarification. Yeah. Uh, you put two teacher retirements in here at, at thirty-five thousand each, seventy thousand dollars. Can you use your mic, please? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'll I repeat. I, the real quick question on the teacher retirement. You had put in here two teacher retirements of 35000 each total $70,000. Um, now, my understanding is that you anticipate the possibility of teacher retirements. There are no teacher retirements identified yet. So is it possible that uh, you may not get any additional teacher retirements and you have to go back and find another $70,000? No, we have at least this many. 
You have at least that. Yep. Uh, so it's not anticipated, it's a certainty. No, we have it. Okay. Yep. I just thought you meant in your memo mentioned you anticipate two additional. Mr. Move to call a question. Okay. It's a non debatable item. All in favor of moving the question? Passes unanimously. Um, okay. Public comment. Now we have to buy. Uh, yeah. Is there any public comment on this item and this item only? Okay. All in favor of the budget cuts as outlined? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you all. And that concludes the budget process for this year. <laughs> yay! Yay, yay, yay. Okay. Um, public comments and petitions, the rules of which are stated on our agenda. Would anyone like to address the board at this time? Excellent. Is there any open board comment at this time? <laughs> Mrs. Brand. Um, I think at our last meeting we started the practice of um, writing in our um, liaison reports. Mm -hmm. They, Thank it, you for sending your Board of Health one, by the way. Oh, you're welcome. But they have always been part of the, the, the record for the board in, in the form of minutes. And if we're going to continue on, on this track, what I'd like to suggest is that at the end of those reports, if they've been written, to have a motion on, um, for, as a standard practice that all written and ones given at the board be included as part of the board record in minutes. You following me? Since we, we uh, might hand need an actual motion or do you just No, no, not for tonight, oh. but it's part of incorporating it into our the format of our agenda. So we have student community liaison reports. And if folks are writing one in, but they didn't think it was necessary to read it at the table, it still would be part of the record of the board minutes. So just have a motion to include the written ones that were submitted as part of the record. Oh, I understand. That way anytime the community members want to have access, it will be easy for them to find it. You, you could do it as, as a motion or you could simply say enclosure one for this report enclosure two as we have enclosures, However, whatever. Yeah, right. But uh, I agree be, with, uh, you know, yeah, that might board be member Brian, that they, they should be attached to the official record. Okay. Right. And so you don't know that you need a motion for it, but we can just, if, for right. special project, small building committee, whatever it is, could, is enclosure five and it's attached in the minutes. Right. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. Good, good point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had one oh, thing for open board comment. I had the pleasure yesterday of being invited to the Rotary Luncheon to recognize um, high achieving students, um, seniors at the, our high schools. And um, I just wanted to say what a lovely event it was and to again thank the Rotary for everything that they do um, for our public schools because um, um, they do do a lot. So, and. Uh, we did. We had Mr. Convertito there recognizing his son and Dr. Title and Mr. Dwyer are both members of Rotary and I see Mr. Um, did I say, what and I, say? I don't know if our student reps are going to be back this year. One more meeting. They will be back. Okay, then we will. Because Sarah was there. Sarah well. was recognized. Yeah. And so was Emma. Both of those. So was Emma. Yes. Yeah. So it was a lovely event. Mm. Oh, Mr. Lou. Yes. Um, I just had a question, Dr. Title. Is, is it true that um, McKinley, according to the state, is in racial imbalance again? Yeah, we haven't received anything officially yet on that. Um, in our verbal conversations with the state, um, the preliminary figures indicate we're about where we were this time last year, which was just like a percentage point off. Um, but when we get something in writing, we'll share it with the board and with the public. And if there needs to be any action around that, that would come with that letter as well. It's unclear right now. So right now, everything we have is verbal. So until I see something in writing from the state, I don't want to put too much stock in a verbal. Okay. Sure. Um, and just uh, the last meeting when we had the math curriculum, you had uh, said that you could get us the pilot results from the math thing. And you had said, oh, yeah, I could get that for you. Right. Do you think They're we working get on it. Okay. Thank you. We didn't lose track. Okay. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move by Mr. Convertito, seconded by Mrs. Brand. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>